Now, we're going to get into continuing our study on the book of Revelation. And we're dealing with Revelation chapter 3. One church there we're going to talk about today, and that's the church at Sardis. So we're going to begin reading in Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 to 3, and we'll break that down first. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write. Now let me stop for a moment here. When the Apostle John got this revelation, he was on the Isle of Patmos. He was a political prisoner for the word of God. And he was there for 18 months. He was over 90 years old. They took him from Ephesus, and they moved him to this island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And it was a prison colony. Basically, set divided into two sections, one for criminals. They had heavily, uh, heavy uh, guards that guarded them, and they were actually in cells. And uh, then they had political prisoners who were free to wander all over the hills and uh, the mountains in uh, this particular island of Patmos because they didn't have to worry about anybody trying to swim to shore. It was too far away, and the sharks would have got them anyhow, probably. But the point is that many Christians were there. So they, they developed colonies, and the, uh, the apostle John was the oldest living apostle. He was living in a cave somewhere, and he gets this revelation about what was and existing at that time in the churches and what was to come. And this is where the apostle John gets this revelation to the angel of these churches. Now, angel in the Greek word means a messenger. Most likely, he was talking to the leadership and the ministry, because ministry and leadership and pastors and teachers, apostles, prophets, what, and evangelists, what they do is they provide the understanding of the Word of God. Now, you can read the Word of God on your own, but they're supposed to be able to enforce and to be able to teach sound doctrine, those principles that were first delivered by Jesus to his original apostles, and then also to all of those that they had placed in positions of elderships in all the churches. Now, these seven churches in Asia that these messages come to, the the pastors and the leaders are basically all kind of in a circle, and they represented all of the churches all over the Roman Empire at that particular time. So when the Apostle John is speaking to the angel of the church in Sardis, he's literally writing to the pastor or the leaders in that church. And what does he say? Let's look at this. These things he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now some people say, wait a minute, I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. He's not talking about seven different spirits of God. Translated in the Greek, it would have really meant this, that it was the manifold manifestations of the Spirit of God. There's only one Holy Spirit. Everyone got that clear? There's only one God. There's one Holy Spirit. He's fully God. But he manifests. There's a manifold um, presence that manifests in different ways. We know that there are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Each gift is not a Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts that he gives to the church. The seven stars, we already know from the uh, beginning when he was talking to uh, the church and said, I hold these seven stars in my hand. The seven stars are the ones that burn brightly. They're supposed to be these pastors of these churches. And of course, we know that Jesus walks in the midst of the congregations. He's right here right now, wherever two or three are gathered in his name. The Bible says he's right there in the midst. Amen? So we go on, and he says this, quote, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Uh Uh-oh. Everyone say, "Uh uh-oh. Don't so, so, sound so good here. Now, he's rebuking the pastor here who is obviously doing something wrong with the giving of information to the, to the church, the local church there in Sardis, or he's allowing certain sins to go and not speaking against those sins at all because he doesn't want to upset maybe the numbers that he has in his church because it will affect the offerings. I don't know. But all I do know that Jesus is rebuking the leadership because of either what they're not saying or what they are doing or what they're tolerating. So he goes on. 
Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. In other words, the process is not good. When Jesus comes to you and says, listen, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. A name that you're alive. In other words, on the outside, everything looked like it was okay. But on the inside, something was causing a slow death to happen. We're talking about a spiritual death here. And he goes on after the comma, he says in, in verse 2, For I have not found your works perfect before God. The word perfect here means complete. Remember therefore how we, uh, you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Hmm. In verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard. How did they receive it? Well, they received it because holy men spoke the word of God. The original apostles laid down writings when they were alive and they were passed around all the churches. The apostle Paul said, for I received from the Lord, which also I passed on to you. And then, of course, we're talking about the communion. For I received from the Lord, which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it gave thanks, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so therefore, what they had heard, and they received. Now, somehow, they got deterred from delivering the purity of the teachings in the word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, if we could put that up, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote about the latter times. He said, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Not all, but some. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's pretty, that's pretty seriously dangerous. But that coincides with what Jesus said. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. Strengthen that which was about to die. I'm talking about spiritually dying. And how can we spiritually die when we get away from the purity of the word of God? You've heard me say it many times that being in the ministry for a long, long time, I've watched the church in America go from being spirit-led and spirit-filled to now entertainment-led and entertainment filled. And rather than the churches being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the first, the cornerstone, they're really built upon who has the best, youngest, good looking worship team that can write beautiful praise and worship songs. Now, I'm a musician, I love music, and music is a tool. But when music and singing and the entertainment and the talent of individuals replace the theology, which is the study of God's word, then we got a problem because we're feeding nothing but the natural man. And the natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit of God. He gets along great with the world. He gets along great in a church that has music that is very similar to the world, but just the, world's, the words have changed. They're very soothing. Now, I don't think we should throw out all the good music because it's not the music problems. Jesus says it's the angel of the church, the messenger in the church, which is the leadership, the pastor, the head honcho, the person who controls the flow of teaching. It's just known that most individuals that are great guitar players and great singers really don't know the word of God that well. But they're very talented. But what happens is when we get caught up into the idea of an individual's talent or his charisma as a speaker or the way they look on the outside, it's the very opposite of what Jesus said. God does not look on the outside. He looks at the heart. He said to the hypocrites and the Pharisees, he said, he said you are hypocritical. He said, you wash the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. And that really aggravated the people. Why? 
because they were lifted up by the, the accolades of people. And not by their living according to the word of God. In 2 Timothy, Paul is exhorting his, um, his protege, which was uh, Timothy. Timothy was young. Paul sent him in as the pastor of this local church. And he, you could tell he was having problems with some of the older people that were looking down on his youth. And Paul was trying to encourage him because Timothy wasn't really an outspoken type of guy. But he's the one that had the heart for the sheep. And he had the heart for the lost. So the Apostle Paul put him in charge. And then he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll read verses 4 to 6. Very apropos for today. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Some people forget that there's still a judgment day coming. He's going to judge the living and the dead. By the way, we pass out of the, adju the judgment as true Christians when it comes to judging whether we're going to be with Christ or in hell with the devil and all the wicked individuals forever and ever. But we still get judged for what we did, our deeds in our body, not the sinful things, but things that we did for the kingdom of God, for rewards. Amen? He says this, preach the word, verse 2, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, when you least expect it, you could be on to be able to witness to somebody. In other words, you could be on your job and having a bad day and all of a sudden the person that you've been working with, they knew you were a Christian, something tragic happens in their life, they got you aside on a break and they go, listen, tell me about your faith in God because I'm really down right now. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit says, you're on. And then all of a sudden, you might not have been having a great day, but the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you. Now, some of you had this happen. I've had it happen many times over the last 40 years where I'm not in the greatest of mood, but all of a sudden, I'm on. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I start speaking the word of God, and I'm lifted up too. I'm preaching to myself, kind of. And by the time I'm done and the person might get saved or accept Jesus as Lord, I'm walking away and saying, thank you, Jesus. Realize that we are instruments in the hands of Christ. Anybody ever have that happen to you? Yeah. It's a true thing that happens to us. This is what he says to Timothy. He says, now the spirit, well, we read that one. I charge you. And then he goes, preach the word, be ready in season, verse 2, and out of season, convince Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Let's break that down. Well, we know the in season, out season, uh, out of season. Convince. Convince means to persuade. It means you've got to work at it. How about rebuke? We don't rebuke the lost. Because the lost are, it's like saying to a pig, I rebuke you for being a pig. A pig would look at you and say, well, I am a pig. Oh, okay, I thought you were an eagle. No, but we Christians are not supposed to be like pigs. We're supposed to be like eagles, okay? So therefore, who we rebuke is basically those individuals who say that they're Christians and they're not. And Jesus is going to allude to this later on. He says they say they are, okay, Jews, but they're not. They're just, they're a synagogue of Satan. And we'll go over that in a few minutes. It's not talking about Jews as people. It's an allegory to talk about individuals who say, they're one thing, but they are another. Okay, but we'll go into that in a moment here. So convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. How many people have, that have children? Let me see your hands. How many people have long suffered trying to teach your children right and wrong? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, so you know what that's all about. Long suffering. Okay, it means in English, long suffering. Okay. That's what the word means in Greek, and it means in, in every language. Long. How long? Long. You notice that the NG is silent? Do you know why? I think it's because it, in this particular, it never ends. It's like it goes on for infinity sometimes. Long. You never say good. 
long, it's long, NG is silent, at least in the English language. But it's a long time. And this is verse 3, and this is the one we zero in here. For the time will come when they will not, this is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, will heap upon themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. Let's break it down. For the time will come. He was talking about the future. Now, the Apostle Paul did not live to see the Apostle John get exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Most people believe that the Apostle uh, Paul was, um, was killed. He was beheaded in Rome around 60 to 75 AD. The Apostle John went to the Isle of Patmos later. He was the last living apostle. So the Apostle Paul is talking about the future. He's seeing this in the spirit. They will not endure sound doctrine. The word endure means that under pressure, under persecution, under intense uh, long suffering, they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll endure doctrine, but they won't endure sound doctrine. In America today, the church in the United States of America is having a problem enduring sound doctrine. And it has everything to do with the size and the magnitude of some of our local churches. Thousands and thousands of people where their pastor becomes more of an executive running a corporation than he does a simple shepherd with a flock of sheep. He's like a farmer who has thousands and thousands of sheep. He's basically not doing any of the work. He's just doing all the managing, trying to keep everything going and keeping everybody hired and keeping all this stuff going. Competing with all the other churches that are super huge. It's not that God doesn't mind a large church, but large churches become very difficult to be able to keep the intimacy that Jesus had with his disciples of 12 or even the 120 in the upper room. But now a small church in America would be considered less than 100 when a large church in the early church in the days of following the crucifixion of Jesus' resurrection, the churches had between 12 and 20 people in them. That's because of persecutions. They couldn't meet publicly. They had to meet in the houses, and it just was like family gatherings. That's what they kind of... They had to just tell people it was that way. They had to be very, very careful on what they were doing because of the persecutions. So sometimes what happens is we have a tendency to, when things get so big, we have a tendency to start seeing numbers rather than disciples. What do I mean by that? Jesus never said, go out and build a big church or go out and build a church and go out and start a church somewhere. He never said that. Go into all of them, preach the gospel and make disciples. Why? Because a disciple is somebody that's basically, in, in the Greek, it meant that somebody was sitting at the feet of the teacher. And most philosophers, this is where it comes from. It comes from the Greeks, the Romans picked it up. But these individuals that were in a pursuit of value, such as virtues, and what was true, and what was false. We've lost that in America because lying is a way of life today by many people. It's a way of manipulating individuals uh, to get them to do what you want. Meanwhile, you're not even telling the truth because you can't even produce what you're saying you're going to produce. But because people have itching ears and they want to hear what they want to hear, they'll follow anybody who tells them it, even though they don't produce the thing. They just keep lying to them all the time. Eventually, we'll get around to it. Eventually, we'll get around to it. Yeah, we can't do that now. They always have an excuse. They don't speak from the heart. But we as Christians can't use those techniques. We have to tell the truth. And telling the truth is going to cause long suffering to happen to us because there are unpleasant things to the carnal nature that are in the word of God. And if we do not speak them over the pulpit as pastors, then we get the rebuke of Jesus here, like he gave to the rebuke to the pastor in Sardis. You notice he didn't say to the angels of the church in Sardis. He said to the angel 
The word in the original language is not talking about a supernatural being, by the way. It's talking about a messenger. And the messengers were the ones who stand in the pulpit, such as me. I'm responsible for what I give to you. And I'm responsible for what I did not give to you because I did not want to make you feel uncomfortable because you might leave, leave the church. So today, we have this tendency to want to make the church so inclusive that we allow everyone to come because God is love and he loves everyone. Well, that's the world's mantra. But there's a problem there because there is a morality, there's a system of right and wrong that's in the word of God that's unpleasant to the carnal nature. Why? Because Jesus said it. It's the spirit that gives life, the flesh or the carnal nature profits nothing. Nothing. In English, it means no thing, okay? In every language, I guess nothing would mean nada in Spanish, right? Yeah, I got that one, nada, okay? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. In other words, it's like, eh, I like that church. Why do you like it? Man, I love the worship team. Man, they're playing the songs that I like. But where's Jesus? Oh, yeah, 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 he's there too. It's like he, he's the afterthought. It's like kind of getting involved, in, invited to a wedding where you really don't know the bride and groom, but you're kind of like hanging out with the family. You don't even know their names, but you go in there and say, wow, what a man. I'll take, you should have seen the, um, the food. Uh, it was just tremendous, you know. How was the bride and groom? Yeah, 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 them too, yeah. What are their names? You know? But you celebrate it. When in reality, they were the point of celebration. It's different for the, the mother of the bride and the father of the bride and, and, and the ones that are directly related. They're celebrating with the people. But a lot of the people that go to weddings, especially in these uh, celebrity weddings, a lot of them are invited, not all of them, but because of their prestige. can't be that way in the church of Jesus Christ because we take away from his glory. Think of it this way. Jesus is the one who's walking in the midst of the candlesticks. That's what he starts when saying. Before he even gets into the set, these messages to all these different churches, he says, I'm the one. I, Jesus, I am walking within the midst of the candlesticks and the candlesticks of the churches. He's here all the time. He's not an afterthought. He's not some God that's so far away. He's right here. Well, how does he speak to us? He speaks to us through the body of Christ. And the one who has the microphone in the front, such as myself, is supposed to be speaking as an oracle of God, not wanting to go ahead and make you feel comfortable and leave you in your state of carnality because as far as Jesus says, you might think you have a name that you're alive, but you're truly dead. It's kind of like not correcting your children when they do wrong because you want to be their best friend. My kids were growing up. Some parents said, you know, I want my kids to be my best friend. I said, no, I want them to respect me as their father. Okay, their best friend, okay, they can disagree with, but their father and their mother, they're supposed to obey and they're supposed to respect. I don't obey my kids. They're supposed to obey me. That's why they call me dad or mom to, you know, my wife. They don't call me by my first name, although some people like that, you know, and that's okay. But the point is that that does not establish the authority. The title establishes who's supposed to submit to the authority according to the word of God. You see? That's what the Bible says. If my son says, Dad, I respond. If he said, Rob, well, his name is Rob too, so it doesn't make any difference. He could say to me, Rob, take out the garbage. I'll turn to him, I'll go, Rob, you take out the garbage. But which one has the authority? The son or the father? The one that has the title. Everyone understand that? So therefore, the angel to the church, we're getting back to this, 
This is the person that Jesus is basically rebuking because he's the one responsible for the direction of the learning and the doctrine of the sheep. Whatever they are practicing or not practicing, everyone understand that. We as pastors cannot, and I only find this truly in, uh, in, Western, in the Western churches, like in America, in, in Europe, and in Australia, where the churches are getting huge and huge and huge. Uh, in fact, in Brazil and Colombia, they have actually the same kind of a situation going on. But I remember when I was a, a, a missionary and an evangelist in Brazil back 30 years ago, the churches were very humble. They were very small. And, and the pastors, they were just people that were nothings. And God anointed them, and they could preach. They were very, very humble. Unfortunately, the churches grew so big, they're into the thousands and ten thousands. I have one pastor friend who is now the apostle over 300 churches. And I remember meeting him. He came up here one time. I hadn't seen him in about 10 years, and he wanted to get together with me. And uh, we just quickly, before he was going to take his uh, a flight back to uh, Brazil, he wanted to see me, so he had one of his, uh, his uh, people travel and call me out. I said, I'd love to go. And we just ate down the block. And it was just me and him talking about the old times. And he said this to me. He said, wow, you know, I long for the old times and everything was so much simpler. He said, I remember when I used to meet you at the plane in Brazil. Then we'd, we'd go for lunch. Then, uh, then you'd preach in the church. And I, at the time, he was just, you know, he was just a pastor uh, of one church under an apostle. And then he became one of the largest um, denominations, you might say, which is non-denominational, if you can understand that. They were all independent churches, but he was the overseer. And he said to me, he says, you know what? I miss the days when, when we were all just friends and we didn't have this big business thing to take care of. I said, yeah. I said, but I still have it because I don't want that no more. And I haven't traveled in probably 20 years. I'm very happy. I have no aspirations to do anything other than to deliver the word of God to those who show up on Sundays and then when we start back in, in the fall on Tuesday nights for the Bible study and just teach the word of God. By the way, just a little caveat here. I was a professional entertainer when Jesus saved me at 24 years old. I was a New York musician, a front man. I knew how to draw crowds in clubs. That's what I got paid to do and put together shows. I was very good at what I did. I made a living at it. I made more money than my father made at that particular time. I was swimming in it, but my life was going down the tubes because that whole entertainment industry is nothing but filled with sin, pride, lust, and you get caught up into it. But Jesus had mercy on me. And by the way, everyone in my band became ministers and pastors, and not one of them ever backslid. When we got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, we gave our hearts over to Jesus. So I know what it's like to be able to be before people, but since I've been before thousands and thousands of people, I can tell you, if those of you who think you'd love to do it, it gets old very, very soon because you get to know nobody on an intimate level because you're traveling so much. And you get depressed after doing it for about five or six years because you realize you meet some great people and you're never going to see them again. You always say, yeah, 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 we'll keep in touch. Nobody keeps in touch with thousands of people. You know, you might think you have 5,000 friends on Facebook. They're not friends. Okay, you probably never even met them. You don't even know if that's the person who's put the picture up. Okay, it's so Photoshopped, you don't even know if it's them anymore. Okay, so you don't know. But you do have some close friends. You have close family members. And those are the ones that you see on a regular basis. So into their lives. Be concerned about their lives. After all, if Jesus was into big churches, why did he only have 12? Okay? You say, well, no, Jesus had 5,000. He fed. But even Jesus said, the only reason they're coming to me, all these people, is because of the loaves and the fishes. How do I know? Even his own disciples, when he was taken and crucified, were hiding for their lives except John. He was at the feet of Jesus with Mary, the mother of Jesus. So when it comes to what we do 
usually it's because we're social creatures. Well, God made us that way, so there's nothing wrong with it. But make sure you love Jesus more than you love, as Jesus said, father, mother, sister, brother, and everything. I used to say this, I used to tell people this, but I always told, and this is, a, this is good advice, I used to tell my children, never love me more than you love God. Now, there's a spiritual reason for that, and it's in the Bible, but there is a practical spiritual reason. Because if the devil knows that you love your kids, okay, more than you love God, then he's going to attack your kids all the time. He can't attack God. But if he knows that he can go ahead and get you to turn around and get upset with God because something happens to your kids, why do you think he's going to go after you? He's going to try to attack your kids. Even if he can't take their lives, he's just going to put obstacle and obstacle before you. That's why Jesus said, no one who loves father, mother, sister, brother more than me is worthy to be my disciples. Because the reason is, because the devil will see, ha, there's something between God and them, and it's not spiritual, it's natural. So that's just a word of advice for you. But of course, they got to love you, and you want to love your children. But also, put your children in the hands of God. I don't know how many times I did that. I said, Lord, I can't deal with this no more. Here, you take them. They're yours. <laughs> it's like grandparents, you know. Oh, he needs to be changed. Here, change him, Mom. Okay? I did your changing, you know, when you were a kid. But a lot of times, when I can't figure something out, I just say, Lord, beyond me, here, you got it. Throw the football up to you. You got the situation. You know, I'm going to have a, a cup of coffee. That's about it, Lord. I can't deal with it no more. But God wants us to try to figure things out, but he doesn't want us to get distressed to the place where we're so troubled that he's got us in the flesh. And we're starting to lose our temper and anger, and I cause nobody ever gets upset. Here, you all look so calm and placid. You're all just in the spirit here. You never get in the flesh, right? Never get in karma. That's a joke, okay? We all get that way because we are still in this body. So let's go on. They will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to fables. The difference between truth and a fable is fable is something that could have a good moral, but there are also elements in some fables that are absolutely not of the truth. Okay? Aesop's fables, my, mo my mother used to teach me, they were moral fables. And many of them came from Greek philosophy and Greek cultures. But they're not necessarily true. And then there are fables with the gods, you know, Thor and all these other things like that. Those aren't truth. They can, might have a little bit of truth in them, but you got to be careful with them because they're not fully truthful. And by the way, the devil is a master being able to weave deception into things of truth. If truth was a, um, is a carpet, okay, a rug, the devil has a way of kind of like weaving things in there that you just know they don't belong there, but they're there. You just kind of put up with it because everything else, 99% of it looks good, but one little thing of error, it's kind of like poison. You don't need to drink six ounces of arsenic to die, okay, concentrated. You just need a little couple of drops of it, and it'll do a trick. Follow me? And that's the way the devil works. He'll buy you as cheap as he can get you, really. That's the way the, the enemy would work. But because, why do people turn away? Well, in verse 3, and that's important. Their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap upon themselves teachers. And I've heard some people say to me, we don't need the local church. We got TV. There's a million great preachers on TV. No, that's not the biblical way, although you can get teaching from teachers on the Internet. I mean, I listen to them. However, that, if that's the basis of your theology, you've got a real problem. Because most of the TV preachers are always going to be catering to individuals that have itching ears. And if they're going to preach against sin, such as homosexuality or adultery or drunkenness or drugs and things like that, they're going to be thrown off the air. It's even happening on Facebook and, and uh, you know, uh, Google and, and YouTube and stuff, they're beginning to censor out anything 
that does, is not palatable to everybody. Christian morals are not accepted by the American culture today anymore. If you didn't figure that out yet, okay, you need to get your head out of the sand, basically, and realize that Christians are being persecuted for what they believe. But worse is if the pastors are not saying anything about it. I met a pastor who said, you know what? You shouldn't be mentioning homosexuality as a sin over the pulpit. Why? Because if somebody finds out about that, you know, you, you, you're going to get in trouble. With whom? Who am I going to get in trouble with? If I'm persecuted for righteousness' sake, the Bible says the glory of God is on me. We're not going to preach the truth because we're afraid that somebody's going to be upset? No, something wrong with that logic and truth. But my point is this. This is what Jesus was rebuking in Sardis. The very thing we're talking about they were allowing to happen. Now let's finish up here. Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, before his angels. Now some people say, wow, you can lose your salvation? Well, Jesus is saying this here, and I'll leave it at that. Okay? I'm not going to do the American thing and say, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. Okay? I'm just going to say Jesus said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. It's enough to convict me to say, you know what? I better keep my act together for the long haul. What's the act together? For me, as a pastor, preach sound doctrine. That's why we read every scripture when we're teaching the Bible. I don't just pick and choose scriptures to make a nice sermon and make everybody feel good. Live long enough, and I can guarantee you, in America, you probably heard the best sermons out of the best portions of scripture many times over if you lived in a church for 40 years or even moved around because pastors usually pick the ones that bless the people the most and get them all riled up and stuff but if that was so true that they were preaching true theology how did we lose the influence in American culture I've lived long enough to be able to remember when the Ten Commandments were on the walls of every public school and when the government of every state, federal, and local, uh, every single government in their public announcements used to say, especially on Thursday and Friday, in the mornings and the evenings, make sure you go to your house of worship on the weekend. If you were Jewish, you went there. Anyone remember that? Raise your hand. Okay. Everybody over 35, 40, okay? I remembered that. I remember the Ten Commandments on, on the walls of my school. And I also remember when they were taken down. I was in the ninth grade. It was all taken down, and then an announcement came that there's no more uh, prayer. They're having a moment of silence. That lasted one year, and then there was no moment of silence or anything. That was it. No explanation. Just did it. And now we got a society that's running rampant that they cannot control. You can make all the laws in the world, but no law can control the human heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all. Who can know it but the Lord? But you can be changed, and God can give you a new heart. Amen in Christ Jesus. Well, in Matthew 18, this whole idea of confessing his name before my Father and his angels, okay? That Jesus will say to everyone that doesn't defile their garments, that's willing to say, you know what, I'm going to continue longer here. I'm living as a Christian. I'm not going to compromise God's teachings or his word. I'm going to follow the sound doctrine of the word of God. And I am not going to believe that I'm going to get all my understanding of God from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. I'm going to read the word of God for myself. I think that's good advice. Do you know that the Holy Spirit himself in the Bible says, test the spirits to see whether or not they're of God? That's the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul saying that. Test the spirit. Try the spirits to see whether or not they're of God. And every preacher that is of God should say, don't believe me. 
Look it up. You find something that I've said that's wrong in the scriptures, I'll be the first one to repent if you can show me in the word of God. Why? Because I love the truth and I'm not perfect. But I try to study the word of God. As Paul told Timothy, that I could be approved unto God, a workman not being ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Not fables, but truth. The good stuff, the hard stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly in the Bible. Okay? There's some difficult things in the Bible to practice, but I'm not going to change it to become modern and to be able to have, you know, it, it, you know it, the idea of being inclusive of everyone. Because everybody's not going to heaven according to the scriptures. Only those who believe in his name, he gives them the right and the authority to become children of God. And his name is holiness. His name and his character. Amen. So we finish up and say this. Well, in Matthew 10, 32 to 35, Jesus said this. And it backs up what Jesus is talking about confessing us when we get before God on that day. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her father, her mother-in-law. Now, what he's talking about here, he doesn't want to break up families. He's talking about the idea that if some in your family say, I'm not following Christ and you're not either, you have to make a choice if God's first or not. I tell children whose parents aren't saved that, listen, you have to respect your parents, but this is America too, and you have freedom of religion, and you can worship the God that you want to. Now, you have to subject yourselves to them as long as you are in their household and you're under the age, the legal age in uh, most states is 18 years old. I said, but you can respectfully decline if they ask you, let's say if they were witches and they want you to be, I'm being sarcastic or just you know, hyperbole, if they want you to become a Satanist, you can say I respectfully decline because I believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. But you can't go, I rebuke you, Mom, in the name of Jesus Christ. I wouldn't do that. You'd be locked in your room for the next three weeks probably. The point is you can respectfully decline, but the fact is that you've got to make a decision whether your parents are more important than God. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm just telling you what the Lord says here. But he's not trying to say that you should hate your father and mother. It's in relationship to the love that you have for God. Relating back to the story I told you about, I taught my kids always love God more than you love me. That's important. Everyone understand that? Okay. So let's finish it up. Who is this message going to hear, uh, to hear this message besides the pastor? In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 6, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now he finishes all of the message to these churches with this saying. He starts with the pastor he's controlling the flow of information and the teaching. It's not that in America the, the pastors are teaching absolute error most of the time. It's what they're leaving out for the sake of being inclusive. We have to preach it the way it is and not filter it through man's desires. Just like when you are feeding your children when they're young. Okay, you're trying to give them a balanced diet. Heck, you know, my kids were growing up. Again, all I wanted to do is eat ice cream and M&Ms. I said, you're not going to be, I want, I want, I want. You're not getting it. That's it. And then you start bargaining. Okay, if you eat what's on your plate, you can have a few M&Ms. Okay? But more, if you just gave them what they wanted, Daddy, I want an ice cream. Daddy, I want an ice cream. Okay, you'd be doing them damage. But what you would do is you would win their approval for the moment by giving in to them, but you regret it later on, especially when you got to pay the dentist bill. Okay? Dentists got you coming and going because sooner or later you all up and end up in a dentist. Any dentists here? Okay. But it's true. 
We all need a dentist sometime. How many people believe that's a true statement? I've never met anybody that's never been to a dentist except somebody that doesn't have any teeth, okay, at all, okay? And I said, you're lying, because even if you lost your teeth, you probably had infections, this, that, and the other thing. What a way to finish a message. That's not the way I want to say. Has an ear to hear. Do you have an ear to hear? What the Spirit says to the Jew. The only way to have an ear to hear is say, Lord, I am willing. That's all you got to say. That's my favorite prayer. That even nullifies my will that doesn't want to do sometimes the will of God. Lord, please give me an ear to hear. Don't shut my ear up. Please, God. Holy Spirit, wrestle with my conscience. I give him permission. Don't let me have a conscience that gets seared as with a hot iron. It's not as brutal to a Christian right away that way. It happens very, very slowly and you don't even know it. You start compromising here and you compromise there and you compromise there. And before you know it, boom, God just hits you with the truth of where you're at and you go, my gosh, I can't believe how far I've fallen away. That's why he was warning the churches here. That's why he warns us. Let's stand to our feet. We'll close in prayer.